Hi, I'm David Spencer. Welcome to Gardening with Bugs. Okay, this segment is going to be about the number one aphid predator, Aphidolides aphidomyza. Okay, so the number one product purchased by the homeowner for aphid control is the ladybug. It's absolutely useless, I promise you. Yes, it eats aphids, but it's a grazer, it's a generalist, they eat a lot, but Trust me, if you're buying them, they're wild collected. They're just gonna fly back. They're not the same ones that show up. You've probably seen my video about ladybugs, so I won't go into much more detail about that. But I, want I want to draw your attention to the commercial standard, which is a Fidelides of Fidemiza. I know the Latin terms absolutely suck, but at least it's got the name aphid in it. So we just go by the common name aphidolites, so aphidolites. Um, that's how you order it if, if you need it. Um, sometimes you don't, but what I want to draw your attention to, especially here at Full Circle Farm, is when I apply it. And basically right here I've got a cherry tree, and this is a good sign for me of, of when I do need to bring it in. This cherry's flowering now. Obviously it's been flowering for um, about a week, uh, like seriously for about a week. Um, and it's shortly after this that I get the black aphid, which is the black chariot aphid. Um, and in this particular case, this is a tree I didn't really have a great spot for it. So it's in, it's in really poor soil. It's sharing roots with, with the hedge behind as well as this concrete pathway. Uh, super dry and it's stressed. So it actually gets aphids more than cherries placed elsewhere just because the plant is kind of struggling to keep up with it. So it has a weird growth pattern because some of the growing tips have died from it in the past. Now I didn't always apply a Fidelides and that's spe just specific to me because I was using those aphids to attract predators in order to to collect them and try to see if I can rear them out as an as an aphid predator. Um, but now what I what I do is I wait for those to establish and I put them out. Now it's important to note I'm filming this on at April, it's April 14th, so mid-April, and that's sort of a threshold for a whole bunch of biocontrols, and, and Aphidolides is one of these ones. There's two things to, to keep in mind when using them. One's the amount of daylight, and the other one is the amount of, of temperature, or the temperature. So daylight's important, and that's why this mid-April is so important, because we're finally just past the equinox enough that it believes that it's summertime and their life cycle is a little bit different. When you get into the winter months, a release outdoors like this will, will in the larval stage, so when they're the tiny little orange maggot, it will convince them that winter is approaching. They will actually eat more, but when they go down to the ground to pupate, uh, they, they've prepared themselves to overwinter, so the pupation is quite long. In some cases, if it's truly natural that it's going into winter, they will pupate until the soil temperature increases to a certain temperature and then they'll come back. If you're kind of tricking them in a greenhouse that's warm, the low light, they might pupate for an extended period of time. The pupation might fail um, or it might just be prolonged. It's not the best. So this time of year, what what happens is they just eat the normal amount they're kind of neat they're super competitive and this is where they're they're by far the best is the adult lays hundreds of eggs each egg becomes this little orange maggot that maggot needs to eat around 18 to 20 aphids before it pupates but it can kill several hundred and it's because they're competitive and that's a really important thing about biocontrols the ones that are generalist and just go around eating things that's great and, and there's a place for them sometimes, but the ones that we focus on in order to com become commercially available because they are uh, successful in, in really controlling a particular pest are ones that are very specific. So this one's so specific that the, the maggots are competitive with one another. So they go by biting them. Their, their saliva has a uh, toxicity to it that kills aphids. They just go around killing them and then when it's time to feed, they'll they actually suck the insides of the aphid through their uh, through the aphid's own foot, which is great. We we love gory things when it has to do with killing aphids. 
what you end up with is this this massive this massive amount of, of aphid control then these guys will fling themselves off kind of like an inchworm or sometimes crawl down kind of depends on the situation into the soil they'll pupate there it's, it's typically about a week and a half of pupation before they re-emerge as adults they're they're very quick to lay eggs again as soon as they emerge as adults they will mate right away usually at like dusk you'll see them in a cluster you've probably seen little clusters of midges flying around that's what these guys look like basically like um, smaller mosquitoes is what they look like uh, they'll mate they smell honeydew so that that's how they detect aphids so they'll wait especially on a calm night when the wind kind of dies down that's why they're active at dusk because um, usually those catabatic winds, like daytime winds versus nighttime winds, uh, kind of neutralize for a, for a period of time. That's just a, ge generally the case. Um, they will they can source out single aphids on crops and go lay their eggs there. So you don't actually even have to apply them directly to the tree. I could I could open up a container of them at the far end, and they will they'll find the aphids that I need. They are a bit particular about plants, but usually outside it doesn't really matter. So when you buy them it's really important like depending on where you live you just want to get the freshest stuff so if you're in North America buy North American produced aphidolites if you're in Europe buy European produced ones or North Africa or wherever's closest but don't settle on ones that are refrigerated get ones that claim that they're fresh never store below 8 degrees Celsius because we know it at below 8 degrees Celsius they can as pupa they can last forever and so some producers will just stockpile them and then sell them to you as they need doesn't matter how old they are they'll still emerge when you warm them up however their searching ability is different so when you get them fresh first of all their temperature range is way different they can go they can survive extreme high temperatures and they're way more active at low temperatures but they actually don't discriminate in their searching or they they discriminate better when they're fresh so by keeping them cold they're kind of in a survival mode they will all go directly to the, the first one they find lay their eggs even if there's already tons of eggs there when they're fresh they're more likely to spread out find individual ones they're not in as much of a panic it seems So make sure you're getting the top quality stuff. What you will always find, there's basically two products. One of them is just the pupa. So you receive it, you don't open it, you just leave it room temperature, wait till the adults emerge. Again, they look like little tiny mosquitoes. Um, you could even give them, as long as they're kind of protected from sunlight and temperature, give them a little bit of time in the container to mate. Um, and then again, release them at dusk. Anywhere in your yard is fine. Uh, otherwise, you might get like a hanging vial like this one. And it actually has two different aged pupa um, and the lid is always going to be open you can just hang that and forget it as long as it's not going to fill up with with rainwater you got to protect it a little bit or direct it's not in direct sunlight uh, this is just a sort of a more gentle release um, and it's just kind of nice to set it and forget it but you're always going to receive these guys in in the pupil form they're not particularly expensive um, in, a, in a yard especially what you're probably go going to do is wait till aphids are here and that's going to create a bank for you. You're going to release the aphidolites. They're going to find the aphids or other aphids. Sometimes it's ones that you're not really expecting. Like if I find them here and open it, hoping that they go there, they might go over to the rows and be feeding on a green aphid. That's fine. They know what they're after. Eventually, the, their numbers will increase and spread out. And that's key. So once you have aphids and you release them, the smallest amount, like a 250 released in your yard, will usually get about 20 times increase in that second generation and stay there throughout the year. In climates like mine here in southwest British Columbia, uh, one release can last up to five years. We can still find them returning year after year. Um, in practicality, I usually suggest just releasing them every spring anyways. They, um, they keep their numbers a little bit higher. You don't have to kind of be worrying and monitoring for whether or not it's time to release them. Indoors, I don't recommend doing them in, in the house. It's um, because they're a winged insect you're, and they look like mosquitoes. It's just going to be a bit of a nuisance for you. I think if you really had to control an aphid inside, that's, that's fine. I would be more tempted to kind of bring it outside and let the natural predators take care of it first. But it is an option. But in greenhouses, it, it's certainly used. 
Now in greenhouses, it's really important to turn the fans off at time of release. They're, they're not strong flyers, so a fan can suck them through and kill them. But also all biocontrols, even ones that aren't flying, will hold on to the plant until the wind stops. It's like they're expecting a, a windstorm is occurring and they're expecting that to, to stop before they go into search. And like I said, these guys in particular smell their pest by honeydew and some might smell their pest by walking around and with wind flow, uh, they're not going to be able to do that. So make sure your fan, fans are off with the fiddle EVs, at least we say six hours after release. That gives them time to fly up, meet each other, mate, smell the honeydew, spread out, find their prey, lay their eggs. And at that point you can turn the fans back on because the eggs and the, and the larva, or maggots because they're a species of fly, that's the term we use, uh, they'll crawl around, control the aphids, and off they go. And if you don't have soil for them to pupate, it's still inexpensive enough that you can just buy on kind of a two week program, which is what most commercial growers do to keep those numbers down. That's it, aphid control is super simple with the Fidelides of Fidomyza and most aphid species, and I literally mean most of them, are controlled by this one. You don't have to match up the species to the, to the predator or the parasitoid like you do with things like aphidias. So while I'm here talking about the best biocontrol for, for aphid control in your yard, I also have to remind you that in most cases you don't need it. So when I recommend it outside, it's because you have, uh, you have this tree that gets sopping wet with honeydew and you're going to have a dinner party and you don't want that all over your deck. Uh, or you've got some sort of unique situation where your plants really do suffer from aphids and the natural biocontrols aren't working. But you should really never have to apply an aphid control outside. And the reasons why some people need to is because they have, they've reacted in a way where they've sprayed a soap or a, an oil to the plants and that has, um, it has multiple effects. And one of them is that the smell itself of the soap or like neem oil or something like that wards off a lot of the natural predators. And as soon as the, that application itself loses its efficacy, then the aphids come back, but the predators don't uh, because there's still some residue. And classically with the Fidelides, any sort of soap uh, on a plant tissue will prevent it from coming back. So it's really important when we talk about like organic gardening, it's about we also, sometimes we think it's, it's fine to make all those concoctions out of this stuff under your sink and, and uh, in your kitchen, but really all those things are just pesticides, whether or not it's, you know, uh, a chemical brand name or just some sort of soap or detergent that you've used, it basically is the same. So keep that in mind. Also, what's really important, and I'll cover this on another topic, is conservational biocontrol. And that's the idea of, of providing habitat. So just like you're providing flowers for, for pollinators in your yard, probably, it's equally important to have all sorts of flowering plants in order to feed things like the natural parasitoids which need nectar as sort of their fuel in order to go find the aphids and parasitize them and that's just one example of many. So keep this in mind, you probably don't need aphid control in your yard. Increase your tolerance for the bugs and your patience. Wait for those predators to show up. Make sure you've got crops flowering all the time. Do not use any sort of chemical or soap or detergent if, if, or oil if you can avoid it. Uh, and just and be comfortable knowing that they're, they're part of the system. Like it's very seldom that, unless you've got like a monoculture, that any particular aphid is gonna come and kind of wipe it out. Most of the aphids are native. They, they want to expand in numbers and that feeds populations of predators. And then those populations decline over winter and start again. That's just part of the cycle. Now, if you're not comfortable with that cycle, that's when you can do the intervention. But just use something native like a Fidelides. It's native to the Northern Hemisphere, so there's no problem releasing it. It's into its own natural habitat. You're just kind of tipping things in your balance based on the perfect example of my cherry tree, I, I'm giving it a poor chance by not really having positioned it properly in my yard. So it needs a little helping hand. Otherwise, the rest of the yard is fine. Now, conservational biocontrol can also go in other ways. And again, stay tuned for my next episode. I'll probably cover it off on that one. But uh, you can also plant plants that will attract aphids. And specific aphids are specific to some sorts of plants. Like you can plant um, grass family plants that will attract things like the oat aphid 
or, or grain aphid and that won't spread to other plants so if you're not too worried that your your buckwheat or your sorry your um, your wheat has aphids on it or your rye um, then just grow that aside and let that be a banker for some of the other some of your other predators likewise nasturtiums get that black aphid it's horrible where i live like a nasturtium basically will get covered in black aphids at some point so instead of just no longer doing it I'll just plant it but somewhere else in the yard. I'll let it be overrun with aphids, knowing that the aphid predators will feed on the aphids, multiply themselves, and spread out to the plants that I truly care about. So you got to remember that, although I'm talking about aphidolides, it is absolutely the best. You should apply it if you, if you need aphid control. The bottom line is you really shouldn't need it to begin with. So that's it for me today talking about aphidolides aphidomyza how you can use it in your yard it's super easy we've got tree companies all over the place just hanging them in boulevard trees uh, rose gardens release them all sorts of um, all sorts of public gardens use them all sorts of commercial growers from small hobby farms to large ones use these regularly it's this time of year where you want them to come out uh, they will survive all summer but you don't want to release them at the, at the peak of aphid population mid-summer because you're just not going to give them enough time to kind of get the control that you want. So get it done early. It's mid-April. That's the time to start thinking about your aphid control.